Uh, Vish was talking about locking. And today, we're going to address something that he left off with, uh, which is what are the cases where locking goes bad? And in particular, uh, you can get into a, if you're using locking, uh, if you're causing one thread to wait for another thread, excuse me, one transaction to wait for another transaction, then there's a possibility that uh, you might end up getting cycles of waits. So for example, if I have uh, two transactions, both of which are trying to manipulate uh, or access attributes A and B, transaction one locks attribute A first, transaction two locks B first, they both try and manipulate them, and then they try and read. Well, there's a possibility that transaction, uh, that one of these transactions is going to, uh, excuse me, then uh, each of these transactions is waiting for one another, and neither of these transactions can make forward progress. And by now, you're all graduate students. I'm assuming you've heard the, the term deadlock before. So. Just to be absolutely precise, a deadlock is a situation where you have a set of, well, at least in the database context, uh, where you have a set of transactions uh, where all of the transactions in that set are waiting for at least one uh, of the other transactions in the set to complete. Um, well, this is a problem, simply put, because without releasing any of the locks in, the in that set of transactions, uh, there's no way that any transaction in the set can move forward. So a slightly more detailed example. Let's say I want to do, uh, I have four transactions. Each of these transactions is trying to manipulate uh, three attributes, A, B, and C, or three objects, A, B, and C. Um, so transaction one is going to start by acquiring a lock for A, reading A, transaction 2 is going to acquire a lock for B, uh, writing to B, transaction 3 acquires a lock for C, reads from C, and then transaction uh, 1 is going to try and acquire a lock for B. Well, can't do that because uh, B is already being held by transaction 2, so transaction 1 is going to wait. Uh, transaction 3 is then going, uh, sorry, transaction 2 is then going to try and acquire a lock for C. Um, can't do that because transaction three is already holding on to it. Transaction four is going to acquire a lock for B. Can't do that uh, because transaction two is already holding on to it. And then transaction three is going to acquire a lock for A. Well, now we have a problem because transaction three can't continue until transaction one releases its lock. Transaction two can't continue until uh, sorry, transaction 1 can't continue until 2 releases its lock, and 2 can't continue until 3 releases its lock. So essentially, we're waiting. We've got a set of transactions, each of which is waiting uh, for each other. And kind of the, the high level intuition here is that this waits for graph um, has a cycle in it. Um, one waits for two, two waits for three, three waits for one. Okay, so that's the high-level problem. You have cycles in uh, the, the uh, dependencies, the, the waits for uh, relationships between these transactions. So what do we do about it? Hmm? Timeout. Um, so we can cause one of the, the threads to wait uh, for a certain amount of time, and if it can't acquire the lock, um, then we kill it or something. Uh, I'll get to timeouts. Well, that's, let's take the, the discussion a little bit higher uh, to a slightly higher level. There are two kind of general approaches that you can take to handling deadlocks, um, two general tactics. The first tactic, simply avoid getting into them. Um, come up with some sort of programming model or some sort of invariance and make sure you stick to those invariants. And if you design these invariants or this programming model correctly, then you can set it up in such a way that you'll never get into a deadlock, ever. Um, 
Now, that seems a little too good to be true, and in general it is. We'll get into how that is. Uh, so the second approach would be to simply detect um, somehow that deadlocks, that a deadlock has occurred. And once a deadlock occurs, deal with it somehow. So let's take a look at these two approaches. The first is this idea that we can come up with some sort of property about the way that we design our transactions. And if we can come up with this property in just the right way, then we can make sure that locks are never acquired in a way that could potentially cause deadlock. Any thoughts on how this might be designed? So the processes acquire the locks in a specific order. Um, and that guarantees that there's no cycle formation. Yeah, um, so the simplest implementation of that would be to give each lock an ID number and always acquire the locks in order of increasing ID. Okay, well, um, how, does that, how does that help us? So how, um, how does this guarantee that we'll never encounter a deadlock? Well, let's go back to our example. So we have this thing here. T1 acquires A, T2 acquires B, T1 acquires B. Well, that's okay, because uh, let's say we're going in alphabetical order. Uh, B comes after A. Uh, T3 acquires C. We're still good. T3 hasn't acquired anything yet. Uh, T2 acquires C. Still good, because uh, C is, um, is bigger than B. Um, and then T3 tries to acquire A. Well, there's our problem. Um, this operation uh, isn't valid, because A comes before B. And kind of the intuition here is that a cycle requires, has anyone ever seen the, the Escher paintings with the staircase? Yeah, same deal. Um, there's this, if we can impose some kind of monotonic uh, property on all of the transactions and all of the locks that are being held by a transaction, then we can avoid uh, a cycle, unless we're in an Escher painting. Um, in other words, you can kind of think of this as always going upstairs. If you're always, uh, you're always going from A to B, B to C, C to D, D to E, and so forth, um, you're never going to enter a situation where you have a lock that someone with a higher lock needs. So, does anyone see a problem with this? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me generalize on the, uh, so the, the answer is, uh, the answer was, you have to know what locks you need uh, up front. And that's complete, that's entirely correct. Uh, let me actually generalize on that slightly. Uh, and say that you have to structure your transactions in a way that acquires the locks in this specific order. Um, if we've said here that T3 is, that this particular instantiation of T3 uh, is invalid, um, well, that means that there are certain transactions that we can't express with this approach to locking. Now, one trick, one way around this, would be to simply acquire all of the locks at the start. Before we even begin uh, doing any kind of transactions, uh, enforce that uh, we've acquired all of the locks that we're going to need. So in this case, we need a shared lock on C and we need an exclusive lock on A. Well, we can rearrange those. And now that, 
now that we've arranged them so that we acquire all of our locks at the beginning, we can actually enforce this kind of uh, lock ordering um, during acquisition. So this is kind of the, the uh, two-phase locking taken to an even further extreme. You have one step where you acquire all of your locks, and you have another step where you release all of your locks. So, okay. What are... What, why would we use this? Why wouldn't we use this? Yeah? So if I, uh, to, to summarize slightly, if the lock, um, the locking initially forces you to be, uh, to take a lot of locks, which means that um, if you have multiple transactions coming in um, and all of those transactions take a lot of locks, there's a very high chance that there's going to be conflicts. There's going to have to be uh, delays in your transactions. Um, and in, in fact, conflicts are kind of the uh, contention on locks is kind of the one thing that we want to avoid at all costs. Um, so while this particular approach has the benefit of never ever causing deadlocks, the downside is that it's going to be slow. Um, if there's any kind of contention, if there's uh, lots of transactions manipulating the same data, uh, then this is going to result in really, really, really horrendous performance. Which is why this, this type of approach is, very, is used very infrequently. Okay. High-level approach number one, don't get into deadlocks. Any questions on this idea? Yeah. Are there any other approaches for avoiding deadlocks? There are, so essentially every approach to avoiding deadlocks maps isomorphically to this one. Um, you need some sort of monotonicity property, and we'll get back to monotonicity properties when we talk about detecting deadlocks as well, but um, you need some kind of monotonic uh, or some sort of uh, total ordering over the locks. That can be an ID number, that can be uh, the pointer to the lock, that can be a URL, that can be anything. Uh, as long as you can say this lock comes before this lock. Um, and while there are a number of different implementations of the idea, all of them are almost, they, they behave in the same way. Any other, uh, good question by the way. Anything else? Yeah. Well, so, I mean, the, the two problems are either you have to exclude certain transactions because um, they don't acquire locks in the correct order. Um, in other words, you have to limit the expressiveness of your system. And that may be, may be okay. There are certain conditions where uh, this is actually something that uh, you're able to do. Um, and limited expressiveness means that you can't support all of your transactions. So that's, if you have transactions that aren't supported, that's a problem. Um, the, other, the other possibility is that, or the, the other approach is to simply take all of your locks at the start, but the drawback there is, well, there's two drawbacks to that approach. First, you have to know what objects you want to lock, or you, you at least need to have 
um, an idea of what objects you're going to potentially want to lock, even if you don't necessarily need that lock. And second, you need to acquire all of your locks at the very beginning before you, uh, or you at least need to um, move, you need to, to acquire all of the locks at the very beginning. And if you do that, essentially both of those combine to mean that you're acquiring more locks than you need and you're holding on to those locks for much longer than you need to hold on to them, which means there's a much higher chance that you'll get contention between the two locks. And anytime you have contention, it slows things down massively. Does that address your question? Yeah. Further? Okay. Uh, which is why there's the line there. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, it tries to acquire, it blocks until A releases it, and then T3 takes the next step. Yeah, uh, A, A released. The, sorry, the, the, that line there uh, it says A, A is released by T1. Yeah. Uh, can there be some general system that knows what locks are being held and uh, can use that information to somehow block an operation until, uh, until the lock can be acquired? Uh, yes, although I should note, well, okay, so there's, there's two answers to that. Uh, the first is yes and wait about two or three slides. Uh, the second is uh, you are essentially in that case still blocking thread three. Yes, so, it has. Um, it hasn't acquired A and C, so it's not waiting for a longer spin. Um, yeah, so uh, essentially the, w what you're describing is a slightly more complex form of acquire all of your locks at the start. So um, one way to implement that would be not just, uh, one way to implement that would be to create a system where you just say, here are the locks that I need, and at some point, make sure all of these locks are acquired and then return control back to me. Um, and that system could do some uh, meaningful reordering and the schedule of, uh, uh, it could reorder uh, the priority of who takes over a lock once the, uh, the lock gets released. Um, there's actually, I'd be willing to bet that there's a bunch of lock managers in um, major databases, probably all, several other components that do something intelligent like that. Uh, it's an added layer of complexity, but it, uh, it certainly can be used to improve performance. Um, that's a good observation. Anything? Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, T3 will perform one instruction, acquire A, and then that acquire A doesn't return until uh, A is released. Or uh, in this case, there's a shared lock on A, so if T3 had asked for a shared lock on A as well, then it would be allowed to proceed because shared lock on A. Okay, um, any, all right. Um, okay, so approach number one, 
don't bother getting in, or try to avoid getting into a situation where you have deadlocks. Of course, this is not always possible. Um, so sometimes we need to go to a more um, aggressive approach where we react to deadlocks rather than simply trying to avoid them. So just to kind of start off from a baseline, the default behavior is that a transaction tries to acquire a lock, and uh, if it can acquire the lock, great. Uh, if it can't, it stops until the lock is acquired. So again, the, the kind of high-level intuition to how this is going to work, or how this approach in its most detailed form uh, could work, is that we create what's called a waits for graph, uh, where uh, every single node in the graph is a transaction, and every single edge is uh, a representation of the fact that one transaction, transaction uh, i, is waiting for another transaction, excuse me, transaction k, uh, to release the lock. And recall that the condition for uh, this breaking down was that there was a cycle in the graph. The, the condition for a deadlock is that there's a cycle in this graph. So the really, really brute force solution to this is to simply keep this graph around, maintain it every time you block, add an edge, every time you uh, start a new transaction, add a node, same deal when you unblock or finish a transaction. And if and just periodically look at the graph and say, OK, does this graph contain a cycle? And if you do have a cycle, well, then you need to do something about it because you've got a deadlock. So the obvious next question is, or uh, are there any questions on doing cycle detection? It's a fairly standard graph algorithm. Not, I'm not going to go too deeply into it. Main point, though, is it's hella expensive. Um, n squared, I believe. Yeah. And no, sorry, n cubed um, to do. You might be able to get it down to n squared. Anyway, either way, uh, really, really expensive thing to do. Not something you want to do frequently. And requires a lot of memory. But the obvious next question is what happens when you do encounter a deadlock? Thoughts? What do you mean by suspend a transaction? OK, so release all of the locks. Ah, OK. Yes, pretty much. Um, and by release, uh, you basically kill the transaction. Uh, now, you know, not quite. Oh, sorry. There's supposed to be a uh, you 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 uh, you win or you die over there. Um, full. Uh, there we go. Okay. Um, with a little bit of a caveat there, uh, because, well, if you, uh, you can kill a transaction, but the nice thing about most database transactions is that we know exactly what the command uh, is that's being executed. So uh, if we say update table add one to every row, uh, well, if you kill the transaction, you can start it back up again uh, almost immediately. So uh, the default behavior here is that, um, well, you really can't do anything else. Uh, the, the transaction is expecting a consistent behavior from uh, the locking mechanism. So you really don't have any other option other than to uh, stop the transaction, unless the application developer has given you that information that you need. So. Um, typically, this is handled in most databases via something like an exception. Um, if you can't acquire a lock, it'll essentially throw an exception, and you can 
there are me uh, mechanisms in just about every form of SQL uh, that has transactions to let you recover from uh, that transaction not being able to acquire a given lock. Um, of course, this is not necessarily uh, this is not necessarily something you'd always do. Okay. Any questions on the high-level uh, idea of detecting um, detecting cycles and then reacting by killing and or restarting the transaction? Yeah. That's a great observation. So advantage here is that there's no, uh, I mean, you can use any transaction with this approach. And if it works, it's way faster than uh, just acquiring all of your locks up front. On the other hand, it's hella slow. Uh, and well, in the worst case, you need to restart. And that's going to slow things down even further. Um, there's not much we can do about needing to restart transactions. but uh, doing cycle detection, being slow and expensive, that's totally something we can fix. So um, there's a bunch of approaches that we could take that accept the possibility that we might get a false positive. In other words, we might end up killing a thread, uh, killing a transaction that, uh, that doesn't necessarily need to be killed. But in exchange, we get faster, more efficient deadlock detection. And the trivial solution, as uh, has been pointed out, is timeouts. Uh, I mean, you wait for some amount of time, and if you haven't made forward progress, restart the transaction. Um, there's actually additional logic to doing that. Um, it doesn't just help with uh, with um, uh, with deadlock detection, there's also a possibility that you might be waiting on some dead component of a distributed system. Uh, you might be waiting on a disk drive that's misbehaving. You might be waiting on something uh, that there's any number of other situations that could cause a, uh, a process to hang indefinitely. Uh, but if you're waiting for 30 minutes and your update is only supposed to take 10, then something has probably gone wrong. OK. That's the trivial approach. We could potentially do a little bit better. Oh, uh, th that's the trivial approach. Um, what, are, what are some draw? Uh, uh, advantages, it's really, really simple. Um, no thread needs to know anything about any other thread. Uh, Excuse me, no transaction needs to know anything about any other transaction um, other than what locks are being held. And it's really simple to implement. What are some disadvantages, though? Yeah, there you go. So uh, picking a timeout is one of these mysterious things that is really, really hard to figure out. Because the timeout is going to depend very heavily on how many transactions, uh, on uh, not only the transaction that you're running, but also what other transactions are in the system. If you have multiple transactions and uh, there's a lot of contention in the system, your timeout's going to need to be way higher. And note that this is a, a time-varying uh, factor. In other words, if you are Facebook at 12 o'clock on uh, 12 o'clock Eastern time, you're going to have a huge amount of contention. You're probably going to want higher timeouts. On the other hand, uh, if you're I don't know uh, CNN at uh, 4 a.m. in the morning, there's probably not going to be a lot of contention. Uh, so you can use a much lower timeout. And this basically means that you're going to have to pick, uh, in general, you're either going to have to put a lot of infrastructure into picking a good timeout, or you're simply going to have to pick a really, really high timeout, so when a deadlock does occur, you're going to be waiting 
after a huge amount of time before you actually detect it or fix it. Okay, so a second approach, an alternative approach, is to enforce some kind of monotonic property over the transactions themselves. And the intuition that I'm going to present here is that, uh, did I get that right? Oops. Uh, the intuition I'm going to present here is that a younger, uh, a younger transaction can never block an older transaction. So let's, let's say I have four transactions, T1, T2, and T4, uh, T1, T2, T3, and T4. So we'll start off, T1 comes into the system, acquires some locks, T2 comes into the system, acquires some locks, and then blocks on T1. Uh, T3 does the same thing, T4 comes in, blocks on T2, we're still okay. Uh, the older transactions, the lower numbered ones, um, are still never blocking the higher numbered ones. Uh, sorry, the lower numbered ones are uh, the only things blocking the higher numbered ones. But now T1 is still continuing. It's not blocked on anything. Uh, and it acquires a lock that T4 has acquired. Okay, that's the kind of thing that we would like to detect. So this kind of monotonicity property that a younger transaction can never block an older transaction would essentially prevent us uh, from doing this. Now, how do, we gauge, uh, how do we gauge the age of a transaction? Well, a simple thing to do would be to um, use the timestamp. Uh, so if transaction one holds a lock on some resource A, transaction two tries to acquire the lock uh, and would block, we need to figure out how those two transactions uh, relate in terms of age or timestamp, or really this can be any, uh, like the identifying uh, numbers for the locks earlier, th these two, uh, these can be any kinds, uh, any pair of, of orders that uh, we care to use. So the invariant, once again, is that the, an older transaction, um, sorry, a younger transaction can never block an older transaction. Or, and in, or equivalently, an older transaction can only block on younger transactions. So if T2 is older, the invariant is preserved, we're good. And T2 is older, by which it, it has a lower timestamp, the invariant is preserved. If T2 is younger, on the other hand, then we have a problem. So one of these two transactions could potentially be causing a deadlock. And if that's the case, then we need to kill one of those two transactions. Which one should we kill? Hmm? Younger? Well, the answer is, Depends on what you want to do. Um, so, the book actually, did, or uh, the book in pretty much age-old database literature uh, describes two high-level approaches. I mean, one approach is you kill one of them; the other approach is you kill the other one. Uh, these two policies are typically called "wait die." In other words, uh, keep the one that's uh, that's there. Um, and the other one is called wait wound. In other words, uh, the, the newer transaction, the one that's trying to acquire the lock, wins. So um, basically, whichever one happens to uh, the, which of these you use is going to depend a lot on, well, what systems, uh, what you're trying to do uh, with the transactions. Um, how long the transactions are running. So if you have really, really short running transactions, um, it's probably okay to kill the ones uh, that are holding on to the lock. I mean, really, which, which of these you use depends. Um, 
it's not entirely clear which one is better in any given circumstance. But weight die, weight wound, um, terms that have been used for a while. One kind of caveat I'll throw in here is that this has the potential to create unfair situations where a transaction just keeps getting killed over and over and over again because it tries to acquire a very contended lock. So one thing you can do here uh, to preserve fairness or to ensure that transactions can make forward progress is to always restart a transaction with the same timestamp. So if the transaction uh, is, uh, when the transaction comes back, there's a greater chance that it will be, uh, that it will stay, uh, that, that it will actually be properly, um, uh, that it'll, it'll properly, uh, excuse me. There's a greater chance that it will not be killed when there's a uh, potential conflict. Okay, any questions on these, simpli uh, these uh, slightly simplified schemes? All right. Um, hmm. So, oh, I actually got through that a bit faster than expected. So just to summarize what we've had so f what we've discussed so far, uh, there are basically two approaches that you can take: um, either avoiding deadlocks uh, by having an uh, invariant on the, the lock acquisition order or acquiring all of your locks up front, uh, or by recovering after the fact by uh, detecting when a cycle occurs or equivalently when a, potential, a cycle has potentially occurred, uh, and killing and restarting the transactions um, that are part of that cycle, or killing some of those transactions. Any questions on deadlock? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So these are, uh, so, um, to recap, you're doing a bank transaction, one is depositing money, one is withdrawing money. Um, is it the case that these are independent, uh, these are separate transactions, so one deposit, one withdrawal, okay. Okay, so you have to do the deposit first, you have to do the withdrawal second, okay. Uh, so what happens if you start off with a zero balance? In other words, what happens when you have uh, two transactions, one of which will only succeed if it comes second, um, and that transaction blocks and kills the first transaction? Um, well, that's a problem that the system should be prepared to deal with regardless. Um, keep in mind that our goal isn't to enforce uh, a particular serial schedule. Our goal is just to enforce that there is a serial schedule that works. And it's entirely po uh, the, it would be entirely correct for the database system to come in and say, uh, do, this, uh, do this withdrawal first and then do the, uh, do the, um, the, uh, the deposit. And that would be, I mean, uh, at some point you have to say what is an atomic component of, uh, of, of an atomic block of code. And for databases, that atomic block of code is the transaction. 
So if you're seeing these two are separate transactions, you have to accept the possibility that those two transactions are going to get reordered. In which case, the deposit would simply fail because presumably you have a data, uh, a data, che a data check constraint on um, the bank balance that says it can never go below, the, below zero. Uh, and another, uh, and if the withdrawal came first, it would simply fail. And whatever consequences there would be for that deposit failing would get propagated out of the system. Does that address your question? And I mean, if, if you did actually care about those two transactions executing in a particular order, then you'd have to put them together into a single transaction. Or, yeah, I mean, you have to make them one atomic. Uh, if, if you care about the ordering of operations, then that basically means you need to combine them into a transaction. Ah, so if, uh, so the observation is that if you have uh, first come first served, um, even if you're using first come first serve, sorry, a scheduler that provides a weak first serve, uh, first come first serve guarantee is going to break under weight wound. And that's uh, an entirely correct observation that um, earlier transactions, if they need to get restarted, you don't. You get a weaker first come first serve guarantee. Good observation. In which case, which would be one case where you'd want, if if you want to preserve that kind of first come first serve guarantee, then uh, you'd use wait die. All right, um, so, okay. So let's um, finish up a little bit early. And on Monday, we'll talk about yet another way of avoiding, um, uh, yet another way of avoiding uh, errors call, uh, called optimistic, uh, optimistic concurrency control. Any other questions? All right, uh, see everyone on Monday.